Now let's move on to second species. Each species introduces a few new elements in a focused way so the student can concentrate on one thing at a time. First species was about combining melodic lines without rhythmic independence and with no dissonance. Second species now introduces dissonance. Dissonance creates tension. In a context where the normal sounds are thirds, sixths, and fifths, adding seconds, tritones, and sevenths can make the music much richer. If the result is not the sound random, these dissonant intervals need to be used in a coherent way. This means that, at least in this style, dissonances always depend on the surrounding consonances. They need to be prepared and resolved. You can think of a dissonance as being a dependent. It adds interest, but it can't stand on its own. When we stick of preparation and resolution, we're really talking about using the dissonances in ways which make them fit into the overall context. Of course, there are styles of music where dissonance is much more common, but the basic idea of having a range of interval tension, where some combinations create stronger colors than others, is a valuable resource in any style. Only the details will change. We'll be talking more about this later in the course when we discuss counterpoint in other harmonic styles. Now let's get back to second species and take a closer look. While still using the same whole note canti, the added part will now be in half notes. This means there will be two notes in the added part to one note in the cantus. The only bar where we'll use a whole note in the added part is at the end, since cadencing on a weak beat is less conclusive, all other things being equal, than stopping on the strong beat. The first note in every bar here should be a consonance, as in first species. But the second note can be consonant or dissonant. If it's consonant, the melody can leap. If, however, the second note is dissonant, it must be approached and left by step, so the dissonants don't sound like they have nothing to do with the surrounding consonances. That's what we mean by dissonances being prepared and resolved. There are two kinds of dissonances in second species. In the first, the dissonant note returns to the same note it started from. This is called a neighbor note. As you can see from our first example, the neighbor note could be above or below. In other words, it can be an upper or lower neighbor. In the second situation, the dissonant note moves on stepwise to another note. This is called a passing tone. As with neighbor tones, passing notes can go up or down. Here are examples. Neighbor notes are essentially static, whereas passing notes are dynamic. They create novelty. A melody which consists mainly of neighbor notes is going to be very static. One which uses mainly passing notes is going to be always climbing up and down, with never a moment's rest. So we need to find a balance between the two. Here's our first example of second species counterpoint. This melody uses one neighbor note in the fourth bar and passing notes in the second bar and the third bar from the end. The other half notes in mid-bar are all leaps to and from consonances. As in the first species, leaps allow the melody to open up new registers, avoiding getting stuck. As in the first species, again, the goal is to create a line with an independent contour and with a good balance of stepwise motion and leaps. However, since there are twice as many notes in the added part now, keeping the line interesting without being becoming incoherent is a bit more challenging. Here's another example. Here again, we see one neighbor note in bar 6, and two examples of passing notes in bars 2 and 3. These passing notes allow the line to fill in the interval of the fifth while moving stepwise, and they create a nice sense of momentum. After the scale, the leap in bar 4 pushes towards a new register. 
The line then stays in intermediate register before rising again to the final G, which is also the highest note in the phrase. Once again, the peaks of the two lines do not coincide. Notice also the succession of the highest notes, E flat and F in bars 4 and 5, then the high G at the end. When successive peaks rise step by step like this, it gives the phrase a nice overall sense of direction. Now here's an example with a few problems. Most obvious weakness here is between the fourth and fifth bars. The parallel fifths create a very noticeable hole in the texture. But the parallel fifths between the first beats of the first and second bars, although they aren't quite as prominent, also stand out when you listen carefully. They would be better avoided. Other problems occur in measure three and in the bar before the end. Here dissonances are approached and or left by leap. This creates a kind of distraction for the listener. We are irritated by the unresolved dissonance. If you don't hear these things clearly right away, give it time. Part of the reason for doing these exercises is to refine your ear for such details. Once again, that requires a lot of practice. Remember, dissonances only on the second note of the bar. Dissonances must be approached and left by step. Parallel fifths or octaves should normally be more than four beats apart. And sing and play.